Good afternoon or evening, everyone, depending on where you're joining us from today. Uh, thank you for taking out the time to join our fireside chat today. I can see that our guests are already around. Hi, Annalisa. Hi, Eric. Hi, Moyo. Uh, before I go on to introduce our moderator for today, I would like to briefly talk about the ITL network and what we do. Uh, we are a registered not for profit under the Canadian Not for Profit Corporations Act, and we seek to promote and foster diversity and inclusion in the Canadian legal market. Our mission is to assist internationally trained lawyers and internationally trained law graduates throughout the licensing process by promoting a strong network for diversity and growth. We provide ITLs with opportunities to network and socialize, which is one of the things we are doing here today, and also to advocate for them with all relevant bodies and stakeholders. Our vision is geared towards changing the narrative and perception of internationally trained lawyers and internationally trained law graduates within the Canadian legal landscape. I also like to give a shout out to some of our directors here today. Um, I can see Idiot is around, Cynthia, uh, Sean Smith, Monica. Uh, now diving into our focus today, I would like to introduce our fireside chat moderator, Moyo Sore Balugu. Moyo is licensed to practice law in the province of Ontario and also in Nigeria. She got called to the Nigerian bar at the age of 21 and to the Ontario bar at the age of 23. She articled at the city solicitor's office, City of London, London, Ontario, and she also acts as one of the solicitors at the City of London, City Solicitor's Office in London, Ontario. She received a Master's of Laws from the University of Toronto, and she's also very passionate about wrongful crimes, wrongful convictions, rather, especially in Nigeria. She has a YouTube channel where she creates content for internationally trained lawyers to help them cross the order of getting licensed in Canada after she herself went through the journey. Please join me in welcoming to the fireside chat, Moyo Sore Balogun. Over to you, Moyo. Thank you very much, Kenny, for introducing me. Can everyone hear me? The thumbs up? Okay, thank you. Yeah, thank you very much, Kenny, for introducing me. Um, also, thank you to the leadership of um, the ITL Network, you know, for organizing this um, meeting today because I'm positive that it is going to be very, very useful. I'm also very excited today um, to introduce our guests. We have two people who will be speaking today. And our first guest is Annalisa Sando, while our second guest is Eric Pai. And um, I'm going to start today by reading both of their bios. And I'm going to start with Annalisa's bio. Annalisa Sando is the manager of student recruitment and programs in Alberta, and she's responsible for managing the recruitment of law students and the summer and articling students programs in Calgary and Edmonton. Annalisa is actively involved in law school recruitment activities, interviewing students, performance reviews, and mentoring. Prior to her current role, Annalisa maintained a general corporate commercial practice for several years at a large Calgary-based law firm, and then at a medium-sized Calgary firm. In her role as an associate lawyer, Annalisa advised clients on a broad range of matters, including corporate organization and restructuring, mergers and acquisitions, new business startups, and shareholder disputes. Annalisa gained in-house legal experience during secondments to a large, um, large oil and gas company, as well as a major Canadian airline. Annalisa, we are very excited to have you here today, and we can't wait for you to share with us, you know, um, your wealth of knowledge. Um, welcome. I would also like to read Eric's bio. Eric is responsible for supporting practice readiness education program um, prep students who are seeking articling position roles and developing support services for all prep students. He holds a Bachelor of Arts in Psychology from McMaster University, as well as a certificate in career and academic advising, and he is certified as a resume specialist. Eric is also certified in strong interest inventory, which enables him to provide students with dynamic career direction and insights into options that align with their interests and abilities. 
His prior experience includes international and domestic roles in corporate training, employee relations, recruitment, and language teaching. Eric, you're welcome um, today. We are very excited to you know, have you guys here with us and we can't wait to dive in into the conversation. So without, um, you know, we don't want to waste any more time. Uh, we're going to start this conversation by talking about articling. And I'll just like to say that um, if any of you have any questions, you know, that you like either Eric or Annalisa to address, you can just um, leave them, you can type them out in the chat session. And once we're done, um, once the two speakers are done, you know, we'll, if we have enough time, well, um, I'm sure they will, you know, answer your questions. So um, like I said, we're going to dive into today's um, conversation and I want us to, um, you know, talk about articling. And, you know, obviously there are several steps in the licensing process and, you know, it's different in every province. I'm licensed to practice law in Ontario. So I had to, you know, write the, take the anti exams. I had to write the bar exams, the Ontario bar exams. And I also had to, you know, article at the city of London. And, um, I found, you know, the articling process, I found that the art articling process for me was very, very challenging. And I know that a lot of ITLs today who are here, you know, can relate to that as well. Um, I applied to, I think I applied for 10 positions or about 12 positions. And um, I only got a call back from the city of London. And that was the only interview that I did. And that was the only position that I did, you know, um, sorry. And that was the only, um, that was the only interview I did. And that was the job I ended up, you know, taking. And I've also had this conversation with several ITLs um, and, you know, people can relate to my story as well. A lot of people, a lot of ITLs, um, you know, tell me that, getting an articling position is very difficult and this is you know for them the most difficult part of the licensing process and um, I also get a lot of questions you know people are asking me how were you able to secure an articling position you know I've applied for about 30 or more articling positions some people even 40 articling positions you know and still nothing you know and for the longest time when whenever people you know asked me how I was able to secure an articling position I, I didn't really have an answer. I didn't really know how, you know, it was only the city, um, the position at the city of London that clicked, you know, after applying to 10 places. So I had to just take a few steps back, you know, and I also spoke with my employer just to get some more insight. Like, what was it that I did differently? How was I able to get this position out of Set over a hundred people that applied, you know, what was, what was it that I did that made me stand out? And I'm sure there are several people out there, you know, people who are um, in our audience today who are listening, uh, who want to know what they should be paying attention to once they're applying for articling positions. A lot of people just send out a bunch of resumes or send out a, a bunch of um, cover letters without being intentional, you know, about their application. So um, I'm, I'm sure people want to know what is that thing or what are the things I should be paying attention to while putting together an articling, um, an articling application. And I'm just going to start with you, Annalisa. Um, you know, you manage um, and recruit, uh, recruit law students and summer and articling students, you know, and I'm sure you're very vast with this area. So I'll just ask um, if you can tell us, you know, that particular thing or share some tips with us that you think would um, help our audience today. Absolutely. Uh, thank you for the introduction and thank you very much for the in invitation here today. Um, on behalf of Bennett Jones, I'm very pleased to be here representing uh, the firm and hopefully can provide some insights that will be helpful uh, along the way. Um, when it comes to the application process, um, I was thinking about, you know, is there a difference between international trained lawyers and sort of Canadian law students and what we look for differently? I would say it's not so much that we're looking for anything different, but uh, certainly the things that um, stand out for an application, whether it's a Canadian law student or an internationally trained lawyer, is first and foremost that they are interested in the firm that you're applying to. So when you get an application that feels very generic or it's just addressed to you know who, whoever it may concern, the hiring manager, and rather than addressing, you know, I'm interested in working at Bennett Jones or at Denton's or whatever firm it is or any um, you know place you're applying, um, it very quickly 
you know, can kind of screen people out if you just read it and you go, why does this person want to work here? So certainly take a little bit of time to think about, you know, the places that you're applying, what you're interested in, and uh, address that right off in your cover letter. Um, and again, we get applications, uh, you know, I work in our Calgary office from, you know, candidates all over the country, all over the world. You don't have to have a connection to Calgary per se to get a job with us. We, we want to hire people from all over. And uh, we certainly do. Our class reflects that. But if, um, you know, sometimes we get letters and people don't even say the word Calgary in their cover letter. And you look at their resume and all of their work history is in Toronto or Vancouver or anywhere, um, a short line, just something about why, you know, you're looking to move to Calgary, what, um, even if you don't have family connections, that doesn't matter, just something that shows an interest in the market that you're applying for. Um, firms, I mean, again, I, I can only speak for Betta Jones, but I know that generally speaking, firms are looking to hire summer students, articling students with a long-term view that they become a student. And so we want people that are, you know, we can reasonably anticipate that they will actually want to be in Calgary or wherever you're applying for a period of time. So uh, just give that some thought as well. Um, and also would just say that um, the best way to learn about what a firm is looking for in an application um, is to speak to people like me at the firms, like never hesitate to reach out and ask because, you know, most firms are just looking for a cover letter, a resume, your transcripts. Uh, they don't necessarily need reference letters. They don't want writing samples. And so, um, you know, target your application, give the firm what they're looking for. And um, the easiest way to do that is to speak to the firm. And I know that people in my role are always happy to have those conversations uh, with people. So uh, those would be some of my highlights right off the top. Thank you very much, Annalisa. Um, and I'm, I, I really can relate to what you said about having a connection to like the location of the firm. I remember during my article interview, um, I lived in, I've always lived in Toronto and all of a sudden I wanted to move to London, you know, like I was asked why London, why yeah. did you pick London, you know, uh, law firms want to or municipalities, whatever organization you're applying to, they want to uh, um, understand that you have a connection and they're, you're not just picking them as a second option, you know, or as a last resort or whatever. Thank you very much. Uh, Eric, do you have um, anything to add to what Annalisa um, has said? Eric, I think you're, you need to be unmuted. Yes. Yeah, sorry. I have a habit of turning my mic off when somebody else is talking and I forgot as usual. Um, you know, I've, I've been in my role now for almost six months. Uh, so I'm still fairly new to the legal profession in terms of helping with resumes and, and working with students on, on getting articles. But uh, one of the things that I did when I first started was uh, I met with a bunch of legal recruiters in Alberta, and Elisa was one of them. <laughs> um, and so I, I kind of picked up a few things from them that uh, you know I thought would be useful to pass on. So um, the first thing is, particularly if you're interested in uh, working at one of the bigger firms, is you have to be uh, going through the OCI process on the VI uh, law portal. Um, and if you're not going through there, um, you know, the, it's they're fairly strict with their timings and when the interviews are and when the application timings are and so on. And so uh, a fair, quite a lot of the, uh, the firms don't really consider applications outside of those timings. And so if you're sending off applications willy nilly everywhere, uh, you're kind of wasting your time a little bit. Um, unless you just happen to hit a firm that is that has an immediate need for somebody off cycle and the timing is right. Um, you're kind of wasting your time there. So that's one thing to, to be aware of. Um, another thing that's really important, uh, and this is important whether you're a lawyer or a law student or an accountant or whatever, is you know what is the firm buying? Um, and this kind of uh, draws on what Annalisa said about you know knowing a little bit about the firm, being able to write about that in your cover letter, being able to kind of tailor your resume to that firm. But what are they buying? And, and how is it that you meet those requirements that they're looking for? And make sure that you're highlighting stuff that is relevant to the firm, the kind of law they do, the location they're in, all those kinds of things. Um, what I find in, in a lot of resumes is that there's far too much information and that a lot of the information is irrelevant because the person is packing in everything they've ever done in any job, whether it be legal or not, 
that they think is good. Um, and so you really have to edit um, and, and make sure that you're really focusing on the priorities of the firm in your application. Um, the third thing I would say is, um, you know, a lot of times uh, in, in the resumes that I look at for the students that I work with, you know, people are claiming to have time management skills and they're claiming to have uh, problem solving skills and they're claiming to have communication skills. The problem is, is that every single person who applies for a job claims to have those same skills. Uh, and so it becomes noise unless you provide some kind of proof. So for example, uh, if you're claiming to have uh, entrepreneurial skills, uh, you want to give an example of when you showed that. So for example, and I'm gonna read this because I made some notes ahead of this. After several of my classmates mentioned to me that they needed help with classroom presentation skills, I set up a new Toastmasters group. We were able to get some guest speakers in, including our MLA and practice in a safe environment. Now that there, if you're saying I have entrepreneurial skills, that example there, and that could be in a profile, it could be in one of your job descriptions, it could be part of one of your volunteer activities, but now we've got a story, we've got a context, and your claim is believable. Uh, and so you need to be backing up all of the things that you're stating in your cover letter. I have this, I have this, I have this. It's like, well, you know, show me, tell me, make, make me believe you. The next thing I would say is uh, also, uh, and this is uh, uh, some of the feedback that I got from a lot of the recruiters I talked to, is that your interests are important. Uh, and so I see a lot of people who kind of, you know, they cram in all their education and their volunteer activities and so on. But a lot of times, because articling students aren't necessarily expected to be expert lawyers yet, the recruiters are looking for what kind of person are you? Who are you? How are you going to fit into our firm? And the interests can say a lot about that. Again, though, you have to kind of add some color there. You can't just really say, you know, my interests are reading, running, and travel. Because, okay, everybody has those interests, I'm, I'm guessing, at least to some extent. So tell me something about that. So again, I'm going to read this. But for example, if you're claiming reading as an interest, you could perhaps give some color to it by saying, I challenge myself to read two books monthly, one fiction, one nonfiction, outside of my school reading. I just finished reading Final Disclosure by Beverly McLaughlin, former Chief Justice of the Canadian Supreme Court, that looks at what justice means in the courts and on the streets. And your entry. But now what we have is we have an example of your reading. We can see that you, uh, you know, you're interested in law, you're interested in you know, what that's all about, you're reading uh, stuff that's relevant to the practice of law. Um, of course, you're gonna have to be willing to talk about that book in an interview if necessary, because perhaps the recruiter has also read the book or the partner has also read the book. And so they might ask you some more detailed questions about it. So you can't just kind of like lie about it, but um, you know, back that up. And so, for example, running, you know, I'm a marathon runner. I've ran, run two marathons sub four hours. And just that detail tells me you de you're dedicated, you, you, you are able to plan your training and a whole bunch of other things that are related to that interest. And, you, you know, you have some kind of um, resilience to you. Uh, just a couple of other things that are related particularly to, to internationally trained lawyers. Um, and this is something that I see a lot as well in the work that I do with PrEP. Um, one is names. Um, different countries have different standards for how you present your name. Uh, and I see a lot of cases where I get an email from an email address that doesn't match the name header in Outlook, that doesn't match the name on the resume, and doesn't match the name uh, on the sign off to the message in the email. Uh, and so sometimes people are using an English nickname. Sometimes their name is not written in the order of first name, last name. Uh, sometimes there's a middle name. Sometimes they're starting with the family name and then giving their first name and last name. And as a Canadian, I don't necessarily know which name is which if it's a foreign name. Uh, and so what you need to do is uh, decide how am I going to be called in the office? Which first name do I expect people to use for me? What's my family name? And just use those two. The reason for this being, number one, recruiters may be unsure what to call you when they interview you. They may be unsure what name to address an invitation letter to. 
But even more important, your application could get lost because they may have you filed in a database under one name and they're getting communication under another name and they think that this is two different people. Uh, so be really, really careful about that. And the final thing I would say in the formatting of resumes, uh, different countries have different uh, kind of ways of reading and different ways of looking at written material and understanding it. Uh, I spent 12 years in Japan and when I first got there, I was blown away by the look of the newspaper because it just looked like noise. Um, partly because they write from top to bottom as opposed to left to right, uh, but also just the density of, of material and the amount of bolding and the amount of all kinds of uh, other things uh, that are very different from the way that a Western person would look at text. Um, and so be careful about how you're formatting your, your application so that a recruiter, when they look at it, is not looking at it and going, oh, this is horrible, but is actually kind of looking at it and going, oh, this is an attractive document. I want to find out more. I want to kind of dive into this because it's inviting, okay? Uh, I know that's a lot. Um, there are lots of other things too, but I just thought that those were some things that I could offer. Thank you, I don't know what, Yeah, and I don't know how Annalisa would uh, respond to some of those uh, from her viewpoint where she's on the other side of the desk kind of thing from where I am. <laughs> No, no disagreement here. And the interest section is one that uh, I personally am a real sucker for. And uh, everything you highlighted, I, I certainly agree with, especially. Yeah, you guys have shared a lot of helpful tips and information. And just to add to what you said, Eric, about the interest. So in my um, resume, I had written that I, I love reading, obviously. And you said, you know, every, almost everyone would include that in their resume but I included the title of the book that I read and during my interview I was asked about it you know you said you read smart money woman tell us about the book <laughs> you know if I had lied about the book I would have been stranded you know and I was so happy to talk about the book because you know I read the book and I was able to tie that in into like how I want to become like um I want to be a, a smart woman with my money, you know, when I start like any money from the city, you know, so it's a conversation starter and it's, it's always good, like you said, to include, to include that in your, um, in your application package. So Eric, you mentioned something that um, one of the best way to work for um, bigger firms is going through the OCI. So um, Kenny or any other person, correct me if I'm wrong, I don't think ITLs have um, the advantage or have access to um, go through the OCI during like um, um, the recruitment cycle. So I don't, how, how can ITLs work with bigger law firms or apply to bigger law firms if we don't have you know, the advantage of, um, of going through the OCI? I, I can speak to that yeah, if it would be helpful. Um, so yeah, like our, we have three recruitment cycles where we hire first year law students, second year law students and articling students. Um, the students that we hire in the 1L and the 2L recruits, um, they typically, we give them articling offers once they've summered with us. Um, and for people who are internationally trained lawyers, you may not have the same ready access when you're in a Canadian law school and you see all the posters go out, you know what all the timing is. Um, so I, I couldn't necessarily speak to how um, you can become aware of those dates. So I don't know if your organization can post them somewhere, but like for instance, the 1L recruit is coming up this February. So we'll be taking applications the last week of January, interviewing in February for 1L positions. And so we do see applications from internationally trained lawyers in these recruits. And it's not to say that you can't get an interview or a job through this process, but the caution is just that if you've already graduated law school internationally and you're looking to article, when we're hiring 1L students for you know, summer 2021, um, if you're ready to article, that may not be as attractive to you because you're looking to art start articling right away. Whereas if you get hired in this process, you would summer with us in 2021, you would get an articling offer, but then you wouldn't article until like two years out kind of thing. So again, firms can adjust that. And we've had uh, instances where, you know, people get hired and off cycle recruits and that kind of thing. But the reason why those um, law school processes so the 1L and the 2L recruits um, can be, I think, frustrating for internationally trained lawyers is that the firms generally are looking for 1L and 2L law students as opposed to articling students. 
So that's just a something to keep in mind. Um, but it's not to say that you can't get an interview and you can't get hired through that process. Um, and another thing I would just add is having your NCA certificate or your LLM completed when you're applying for a cycle is, um, just speaking from Bennett Jones, it is um, sort of a big deal on our end that you have your NCA certificate in hand already so that when an articling cycle comes around, you're ready to start. Um, I guess we had an issue one year where we hired somebody who was like, I anticipate having my NCA certificate, you know, in six months from now when I start, but then they didn't. And so then when that cycle rolled around, we were short a student. Um, and so again, I know that can be frustrating because uh, my understanding of the NCA process, it takes a while, it takes a while to get exam results done, but it's one thing that firms may be a bit shy to hire someone when they don't have their certificate yet, just because they need to know that, you know, under law society rules that you'll be eligible to start articling when we need you. Yeah, if I can just add to that, um, uh, I would say, uh, you know, if you're applying for 1L or 2L uh, summer positions, you can do that while you are still uh, in the NCA process, um, at least at some firms. Um, the other thing I would say is that um, any law student can get an account on VI Law Portal. Uh, and so you can register, you can input your information from where you got your original law degree, you can put some information in about uh, your NCA status. Um, if you are a prep student, we have actually set prep, uh, we've set CPLED up as a law school within VI uh, Law Portal. So you can add that as an additional uh, law qualification that you're in the process of, of working towards. Um, but it, it and the, the, the great thing is, is that once you're registered with VI Law Portal, you can see the schedule of when the OCIs are that are coming up. And so that's something that a lot of the ITLs are missing, not being affiliated with a law school in Canada and not having a, you know, the access to the career offices there is knowing that schedule. But by being registered, you know, I'm registered as both a student and as uh, an employer somehow, um, even though I'm not an employer, but uh, I'm getting notifications every time a new OCI is announced or every time a new kind of chunk of OCIs for a particular area comes up, I get an email saying this uh, cycle is opening, here are some deadlines, uh, and so you can be made aware the same way. Thank you very much, Eric. Um, that's that's very helpful to know that, you know, there, like there's um, a portal you can register to and get you know, um, these types of information because they're always very helpful to know to know about. Um, you mentioned something when you um, when you were talking the first time about fitting into the culture. And uh, I just want us to talk um, a little bit about this. And, um, you know, a lot of ITLs are coming from different backgrounds, you know, different countries, obviously different from um, the Canadian culture. And um, this was something I also had to learn, you know, when I started out of clean, I noticed that a lot of lawyers like to socialize, like to go out for wine, like to just get together and, and chat, you know, and have a good time. And this wasn't something I was necessarily um, used to back in Nigeria. So I, I, you know, I had to learn to come out of my comfort zone and learn to network more. Um, networking is, you know, another very important one and just learn to socialize and, um, and, and just, you know, blend in with the culture. Another thing I have noticed, and, you know, I'll, I'll also like us to talk about this is, um, it's the accents, right? So, as an ITL, obviously you're not Canadian. I have I have a Nigerian accent, you know. Um, if you're coming from India or what, um, whatever country you're coming from, you have a different accent. And I remember, you know, just one when I started at clean, just struggling with people saying, oh, I can't understand what you're saying, or I can't, you know, hear what you're saying. And I had to learn how to, you know, sort of, I'm not saying change your accent because I, I, that's not what I'm saying, but I had to learn how to pronounce some of my words differently, you know, so I could be heard better because I, I speak for a living. I go to court and when I'm before a judge, you know, the judge needs to understand 
what I'm seeing, you know? So I'll just like to um, hear what you guys have to say about this. What, what are ways by which ITLs can fit into the culture, into the Canadian culture? Like you said, Eric, someone, um, you, you stayed in Japan and the way things um, are done there, it's, it's absolutely different from the way things are done here in Canada. So what are the ways by which um, you would recommend ITLs to, um, you know, fit into the culture without, you know, erasing your identity or without trying to erase who you are? Um, yeah, I, I would say that one of the very important things is, is to not erase who you are. Um, but you kind of have to practice culture. And the only way to practice culture is to interact with it. Uh, and so this is where I think, um, particularly for, for internationally trained lawyers and, and law students, um, volunteering is an important way to kind of integrate yourself into the, the culture, uh, to learn about the culture from the people that you're volunteering with uh, in a situation where there's really no stress or no kind of nothing's hanging over your head in terms of oh if i do badly in this volunteer position i'm not going to get an articling position right um but it's also a great chance to 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 work on things like am i speaking clearly enough that people can understand me um it's a great way to um you know start developing some of those cross-cultural skills that are going to be useful uh, in your resume for an articling position, things like communication and teamwork. And because teamwork in Canada is different than teamwork in another country. And so working on a team as a volunteer, for example, at the food bank or with the United Way or at pro bono law or whatever the case may be, you're going to naturally kind of become accustomed to those things. Uh, you're going to slow down your speaking, you're going to enunciate more clearly, you're going to do all of those things that are going to help you. Um, and so in some ways, it's, you know, you have to give yourself some time to, to allow that process to happen. Um, but then in the case of volunteering for pro bono, for example, uh, now you're also developing skills that you can put on your resume uh, that are law related uh, and very, very useful there as well. Thank you very much, Eric. And Alisa, do you want to add something to that? Uh, yeah, I, I like Eric's point where like culture has to be practiced. You sort of learn it by doing it. Um, one thing that just came to mind on, on that point is that um, when, if you're applying as an internationally trained lawyer who's not just fresh out of school, where you've actually practiced uh, in whatever jurisdiction you were trained in, um, that when you're applying for roles at firms now, especially if you're going to go through the articling process, which most people, you know, it's the easiest way to get sort of, um, rather than trying to get exemptions and whatnot, that um, the firms are hiring you, we're not looking to hire you based on the expertise you had uh, previously. So it's not to say that, um, you know, we don't want to hear about, you know, if you worked in on corporate transactions, like what kind of transactions were those? What firm was it? Uh, what ranking does it have? It, like that's all helpful information for us to know. But when you come in, um, you're going to be treated like any other summer student or articling student. And so uh, to, to keep in mind that it's not that we don't, uh, you know, respect the experience you had before, but the people at the firm and the lawyers assigning you work will be assigning you work based on your summer student, you're an articling student, not a you know, fourth year associate where you might have been before. Um, when I think of some of the recent people that we've had, uh, students we've had who were internationally trained, um, and even some who were trained here in Canada, but who English was not their first language. Um, again, Moyo, to your point, I think that we don't want anyone to change their accent. It, there might have to just be more conscious effort on pronouncing words, but we haven't found that to be a hindrance to people. And, you know, the firm has, we had one student in particular, uh, she was French Canadian, and we kind of gave her some extra supports um, outside of the rest of the students just to help her kind of get up to speed on her English writing, which she did. And, you know, we hired her back and everything was great, but um, it's certainly not something that's a hindrance. It's more just, yeah, making sure that you're slowing down and people can understand you, but otherwise um, an accent, we've got lots of people at our work who have an accent, people who are litigators and Moya to your point are in court and people can understand them. So I think there's, there's more patience uh, out there um, and especially at the firms, like we're looking for good quality people who will be good lawyers, uh, regardless of uh, 
you know, your country of origin or your accent. Yeah, if I can just add one more thing there too. Um, you know, so I talked about volunteering being a, a good way to practice culture. Another great way to practice culture is to network. Um, you know, if you can be meeting articling students at firms that you're interested in, if you can be meeting associates at firms that you're interested in, not only are you getting a chance to practice networking in the style that Canadians network, but you can also be asking about firm culture. You can be, you know, answering questions about, you know, um, what is the firm's attitude towards working from home, for example? I know right now it's probably different because of COVID, but what was the attitude towards working from home prior to COVID, if that's something that's important to you? Uh, and one of the things I would advise against in terms of, of you know, talking with firms is to not ask people about the culture of their firm, because nobody can clearly articulate that. What you need to do is define which elements of culture are important to me, and then specifically ask about those items. You know, so what is the attitude of the firm towards articling students who have children? Or, you know, um, how flexible is the firm about, um, you know, this, that, or the other thing? Um, so you have to kind of pinpoint what you want to know about. You pinpoint what's important to you. You ask about that. Um, because yeah, the, the, the question, tell me about your firm culture, it's you're basically doing a disservice to the person you're meeting because they won't be able to answer the question satisfactorily. Thank you very much, Eric and Annalisa. Um, what you guys said about networking and volunteering is, I couldn't, I, I absolutely agree, is very, very important. Um, I remember when I came to Canada as well, like I, I came in 2016, September, and I, um, like the first thing I did was to volunteer at, at the law firm as a legal assistant. And after that, you know, it was through that volunteering process that I got hired back as a legal assistant, you know, and I started getting paid. So volunteering is, um, is a good way to integrate yourself into culture. Also, um, I, I want to I want to know what you guys think about um, networking. Very, very, very important tool, you know, in Canada today, especially in the legal profession. And uh, we have LinkedIn now, you know, and other um, other platforms that people can reach out to other people, you know, and connect with them. So, what are what are um, some of the tips you can share about networking and reaching out to people? I remember um, Kenny reached out to me on Instagram, and that was how we connected. So, um, are there like certain pl platforms that shouldn't you shouldn't reach out to um, lawyers on, or are there more acceptable platforms? What what are some of you know the networking tips that you can share with us today? I'll start with Annalisa. Um, I'm, I'm just thinking for like the internationally trained lawyers, I'm not sure that I have the best answers on uh, networking. Uh, when you mentioned LinkedIn, um, certainly LinkedIn is one that I know uh, every time I go through recruitment processes, I'll get students uh, at schools who will add me to LinkedIn or send me an invite. Um, I, I technically take the approach that my LinkedIn are people that I actually know. So it's not to say that I won't add people, um, but it would be nice if you could you know, drop me a note or ask to have a phone call first. So at least we have that um, connection. Um, I would just say that speaking specifically to my role and knowing the other recruiters in Calgary, um, we speak quite regularly, like informally, and we have formal meetings amongst the firms here in Calgary and in Edmonton. And um, one of the things that sometimes surprises us is how little sometimes people take us up on our offer to have phone calls with people um like my part of my job description is to speak to students um anyone who's interested at the firm applying at sort of any student level and so um certainly don't feel shy about reaching out to firms directly to speak to people either in my role or i can put you in touch with articling students lawyers uh that kind of thing it makes a, a real big different uh, in some ways, you know, when you get an application from someone and you go, oh, I recognize that name, like we keep track of all of these interactions. And I think that for, uh, you know, the candidates who are interested, it's the best way, the absolute best way to learn about the firms and what they're about. And to Eric's point, um, answering that culture question, <laughs> I think every, every firm will say, you know, it's respectful and all those kind of things. But I always say to candidates, you won't get a feel for that until you talk to the people and the different people who work, because everybody has a different experience um, at a firm. You know, there's certain things that people really like about Bennett Jones that other people are like, oh yeah, that's great, but that's not the you know the reason why I, I like working here. And 
people have different challenges at the firms. And so hearing those different perspectives is the best way that you'll get a sense of things. And it just, it helps make those connections. And I know that like our students and associates, and I know at other firms, like they love talking to people about uh, what they do, where they work, what their experiences have been and sharing that with people. So um, I certainly would encourage anyone who's curious or thinks, I, I know I don't want to bother anyone. I get that when people are like, oh, I know you're really busy. I'm like, it's, it's part of my job. Um, and another thing that uh, Eric mentioned about when you're just sort of applying in off cycle times, generally speaking, yes, that is, um, it's, it's best to contact the firm first, ask if they're looking for someone. But I know in my time at Bennett Jones, um, we've had three times where we have recruited people off cycle and we've had people that come have come in for a composite article, like they start a month later and they do six months with us. And so in my experience at the firm, that actually has popped up more regularly than we sort of expect it would. So, um, and we've had some very sort of serendipitous applications come in um, and we've been able to place people or, you know, somebody who we thought was going to article has decided to move to Toronto or something like that. So um, it doesn't hurt to reach out and ask. Um, I wouldn't say, you know, don't call everybody every two weeks kind of thing, but it is surprising sometimes, at least in my experience at our firm, that we do need people out of cycle. Uh, so yeah, I'll follow up on, on networking. Um, I am a huge advocate of networking. Um, I'm not a huge advocate of networking events, but I am a huge advocate of, of meeting people one-on-one -on -one as a, a career discovery tool, as a chance to just learn more about your profession and how it works in Canada and so on. Uh, for anybody who's interested, uh, if you go to my LinkedIn uh, profile, uh, I have some resources available there. Uh, and the second one in the kind of uh, uh, resources that I have available is a webinar recording uh, about coffee meetings, uh, why they're advantageous, how to get a coffee meeting, what to do in a coffee meeting, and how to follow up. And the only difference uh, in the COVID era between uh, what I talk about in that uh, webinar and what people are doing now is that instead of meeting at Starbucks, now you're meeting at Zoombucks. Um, but other than that, it all works the same. Uh, one example, uh, the other thing I would say about networking, and, and this kind of ties into what Annalisa said about, you know, perhaps being afraid to reach out or feeling like you're, you're somebody's going to be too busy to talk with you. Um, actually, two things about that. The first thing is when you reach out to people, don't make it about a job. Because if there is no job, there's no reason to talk. Make it about learning something. So I'd like to learn about your path. Uh, I see you're an internationally trained lawyer. I'd like to learn about your path to you know, passing the bar. Or I see that you work at XYZ firm. I'd like to learn more about the firm. Or I see that you moved from this firm to that firm. I'm just interested in why you made that move. So make it about learning something. And then the, the second thing is, uh, don't be afraid to reach out. Um, even if the person says no, uh, that doesn't hurt you at all. But on the chance that they say yes, uh, you never know what kind of benefit you're going to get from that. And just as an example, uh, so nine, eight, eight years ago now, um, I made a career transition from HR uh, into career development. Uh, it wasn't a voluntary transition, but it was a happy transition. Um, I was unemployed for seven months, uh, during which I did extensive networking to figure out what my career path was going to be. And then in September of 2012, I saw what appeared to me to be the perfect job, working with accountants as a, as a, as a job search coach. And so the first thing I did was I called uh, CMA to ask them the name of the recruiter so that I could put a name on my cover letter. And the receptionist very kindly gave me the name of the recruiter. So I was like, okay, great. And then because I'd been networking so much and because I kind of lost my fear of asking for things, I said, you know, is there any way that, that she is available right now to have a quick chat on the phone? And the, rec and the receptionist said, let me check. And a couple of minutes later she said, yep, she's free. Um, I'll put you through. And so I had a 15 minute chat with Michelle, who was the recruiter there. 
Uh, I asked her about, you know, what they were looking for in a candidate. I asked them about, you know, some questions about the culture of CMA and how big they were and, and what uh, issues they were having and why they had created the position. And then I got off the phone and I completely redid my cover letter. And I jigged some bits in my resume to make sure that I was hitting on the points that we talked about. What I didn't realize was that Michelle was very excited about having chatted with me on the phone. And she was literally sitting, staring at her computer, waiting for my application to come in. And the reason I know this is that after I got the job, she told me. Uh, and so you never know uh, what kind of impression and what kind of excitement you can create by reaching out to somebody. As Annalisa kind of advised, she said, you know, give us a call first before submitting an application, have that chat with them potentially they to get excited about you. And if even if they don't have a position available for you right now, potentially the next time there's an OCI, they're looking for your name or they see their na your name and they recognize it and it gives you an advantage in the selection process. Thank you very much, guys. Like even, even though, you know, I'm already practicing, it's you guys are sharing a lot of useful information and I'm, I'm, I'm really enjoying the, the conversation. Thank you guys. Um, so networking is definitely a great way, you know, of connecting with people and I will encourage everyone to check out, you know, the resources on Eric's LinkedIn profile. So we're going to move to the last part of the conversation before we um, take a few questions. So if you have any questions, please just type them in the, um, in the chat box and we'll get to it very soon. So I want us to lastly talk about interviewing teams. So um, I got my master's degree from U of T and I had access to the career development office. And uh, so when it was time for me to have my interview um, with the city of London, I was prepped for my interview because that was my first ever interview, you know, so, and I found that very helpful, you know, some, some of my, um, some of my answers were, you know, adjusted. The fact that I was prepped, I just, I just found that very helpful. So I would like to say that, you know, for people who don't necessarily um, school here, let's say you're um, immigrating from your country and you come here, take the NCAs, and now you're looking for an articling position, you probably don't have any, um, any resources or uh, you know you don't have access to the career development office or anyone to properly prep you for an interview so i'd like to ask if you have um if you can share with us you know some effective interviewing tips especially now that you know things have changed people are doing interviews from home everything is virtual everything is on zoom that's a, a little bit different you know as opposed to interviewing in person so Annalisa, we'll start with you do you have any um interviewing tips uh, especially for remote interviewing that you'd like to share with us today. Yeah, certainly. Um, so I'll sort of cover two things uh, just briefly, just the, the style of interview, um, at least at our firm, and I know uh, other firms and sort of generally in Canada, the one thing that I, one of our articling students who was trained in the UK uh, made a comment that the interview style was completely not what he expected. Um, here, our interview style, at least at our firm, and I know others, um, it can tend to just be a, a casual conversation, which can throw people off. Like you think you've got to do all this preparation or you know study the law. You're not going to be asked any substantive questions about like, what was this case about or what that kind of thing. It's more, um, it, it's quite casual. So the one thing that uh, firms will tend to ask is behavioral type questions. So asking you, you know, a time they'll, they'll pick a, a job, say in your resume and say you had a lot of client interaction, that kind of thing. And they'll ask you, you know, describe a time that uh, a client was upset, you know, you hadn't met their expectations, how did you handle it, that kind of thing. Um, so behavioral type questions, you may get some, and it may just be a 25 minute conversation about, you know, you say you like to play tennis, I like to play tennis, like, that's why that intersection, a lot of interview questions can come out of there. So um, just so you're aware sort of what the style is, um, it's not substantive law, it's just behavioral type questions and getting to know you type questions. Um, as far as the virtual tips, um, a lot of the, the regular tips all still apply. So sort of, you know, dress the part. Um, as far as the camera, make sure that you have, you know, a good view of your face. You've got an uncluttered background behind you. Um, test out to make sure that your, your audio is working. Um, try and minimize distractions as much as you can. Um, the one thing, and I've noticed this when I do interviews, is that if somebody 
is looking and they're reading off of something, you can tell that they're they're reading. And so um, when it comes time for you to ask questions in an interview, you get it if you have questions, maybe just say, hey, I've jotted down a question. I'm just going to take a look at my notes because otherwise it can seem uh, that people are distracted or they're not quite paying attention. So because you have so little visual cue other than the person's face, um, you can really tell where somebody is looking. So just be mindful of that. Um, and another thing is to sit still. Um, if you're in a swivel chair, try and, and lock it. Um, we notice sometimes people, and it's just a habit, right? That you kind of find yourself swinging back and forth in a chair. So uh, just be mindful of that. Um, but otherwise, uh, on our experience anyway, the virtual interviews have actually gone very well. We feel like we get a good feel for people. So again, it's, you know, be yourself, uh, be engaged with your interviewers, but otherwise, um, hopefully you'll find it, it does feel more natural than uh, you might expect it to. So those would be my tips. Yeah, what uh, what to add to that, uh, if anything. Um, so yeah, I, I kind of jotted down a few things, uh, not specifically about interviewing in general, but more about differences between virtual interviewing and interviewing face-to-face. Um, so I guess uh, first thing I would say is uh, make sure that you're comfortable with the technology that you're using. Arrive to the meeting early uh, by a few minutes if you can, just as you would if you were doing an in-person interview. Uh, make sure you've tested your your video. Make sure, make sure you've tested your your audio, that everything's working on your end. Um, I would say get a headset. Um, you may notice that I'm wearing a headset. Uh, it it really makes a difference. Uh, especially if there is any noise in your home. Uh, so, you know, if you have kids or if you're living with other people um, that may make a noise, um, this will help to cut things out. It also makes your voice sound a little bit more like your regular voice as opposed to some kind of tin uh, robot speaking uh, at you. Um, if you have an older computer, turn off all the other software on that computer so that there's no uh, possibility of interference there. If you're living with other people and it's possible, ask them to get off the internet uh, while you're having your meeting just in case bandwidth is an issue. Um, if you're using a laptop, if you can kind of raise it up a little bit on a pedestal so that you don't get kind of selfie face, which is uh, a, a video taken from below you, which tends to give funny angles. Um, also, uh, you know, this kind of goes to what Annalisa said about, uh, you know, if you're reading, people can tell. Uh, what often happens in a, in, a, in a meeting like this is you can see yourself and you can see the person you're talking to, um, but those images are below the camera. And so it looks like you're not really making eye contact. So if, you, if you're looking to, to have that eye contact feel, what I do is I, I, I minimize down uh, the the window for Zoom or whatever platform, and I move it up so that the person who I'm speaking to, their image is right under the camera. Uh, and so that's a good way to make sure that your eyes are up at camera level and that you're kind of creating that feeling of eye contact. Um, I would say uh, one of the things with, with meetings like this is that ten, people tend not to move very much if they're not on a swivel chair. Um, but be aware of the fact that you know motion is going to help make things feel more like you're having a conversation. So don't be afraid to use your hands. Um, that shows that you're interested. It shows that you're engaged. Um, move your head a little bit. Be expressive with your face. Smile. Those kinds of things. Um, you know, there's a tendency in these meetings to feel a little bit nervous, and so people kind of sit like this, and and it 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 gives the wrong impression. Um, don't do like I do and sit in front of your uh, your hutch with all of your dishes and stuff. Uh, try to have a plain or relatively un, uh, unbusy background. Um, and yeah, I, I agree with Annalisa, dress the part. Um, you know, we, we all see and hear jokes about people who wear a nice shirt on top, but underneath they're wearing like pajama pants or things like that. Um, it's amazing how your body language and your presence will change if you're wearing a full suit. Uh, and so put the pants on, even if you want to put the shoes on uh, so that you you physically feel like you're in an interview because that's going to maybe subtly change the way that you interact with the other person, but that'll be a positive interaction. 
Thank you guys for sharing. Those were very, very solid tips. And Annalisa, I could really relate to what you said about most interviews being a casual conversation. I remember my interview, I had crammed a lot of cases, a lot of sections from the municipal act. And, you know, when I went for the interview, I was being asked about a book that I read. Yeah. <laughs> I, I didn't see that coming, but yeah, you are absolutely correct. Thank you guys for sharing those tips. So um, we're running out of time. So we're going to take questions now. Um, guys, if you have any questions, make sure you send them to the chat box. Okay. But um, I'll just take a, a read, read out a few of the questions we already have. So the first question is, is it, is it advisable to start applying for adequate clean positions before taking the NCAs? Um, I think Annalisa already you know, spoke about this, that you, it's helpful to have your, your um, NCA certificate handy or your LLM certificate you know, before you apply for adequate clean positions. So we'll just move to the next question. Okay, so um, we don't have any other questions. Okay. Someone just sent in their question, sorry. Guys, please keep your questions coming in so that we can address them before um, before we run out of time. Okay, so is it useful stating your area of interest in your cover letter? I yeah. think, yeah, I think Annalisa already covered this as well and Eric as well. They said um, you should state your interest and not just write your interest. For example, reading, tell us what book you read. Um, I'll let you guys add to it if you have, if you have any other things. I would just say um, it goes hand in hand with learning about what the firm does. So if you're applying to a large uh, full service law firm like ours, um, you, you don't need the one thing is that if you come in as a summer student or as an articling student, you're going to have to do a little bit of everything throughout your articling year. So even if you ultimately, you know, want to do commercial like oil and gas transactions kind of thing, you can state that in your interest. Um, but just be careful that you don't or you aren't too narrow where you're like, I only want to be a tax lawyer and tax is all I ever want to do because it could turn you off firms that are like, well, you're going to have to do some other stuff other than tax. Um, and also, you don't need to list everything. Like, if it's a full service law firm, you don't need to say, I'm interested in litigation and corporate work and banking. Like, you don't need to do that. So, if you do have a strong interest in something, um, just make sure that it's not too niche that the firm might look at it and go, Well, I don't know how many tax lawyers we need uh, in that article in class. So, maybe not. So, just be aware of what the firm does and what the expectation will be of you as an article. Yeah, I, I was going to say something very similar, and the, this is a, an example of where it pays to do your research. You know, if you have a particular law interest and the firm you're applying to does that kind of law, then mention it. But if the firm doesn't do that kind of law, then mentioning it is probably going to get you turfed out because they're going to look at you and go, well, this is this person is probably not going to stay with us because they're going to go somewhere else uh, to practice this kind of law later. Um, so be judicious with it um, and make that part of your research. Thank you. So um, the next question is, is there a chance for an ITL who has no legal experience to get, a, to get an articling position? Uh, yes, absolutely. Um, one of our recent students uh, had gone to law school internationally and she had not practiced and came directly to Canada. Um, another one, he did practice in the UK for a while. Uh, another one had practiced in India for a while. So um, no, we don't only hire people who have legal experience. If you've gone to law school and now you're just looking to article like any other uh, student sort of directly out of school, um, we certainly look at that as well. Yeah, I would agree. I, I have a I have a student who got an articling position a couple of months ago, who had gotten her law degree, I think eleven or twelve years ago in her home country, had then moved to Canada uh, with her husband and promptly had a couple of children and did not work at all for the entire eleven years uh, in law or in anything else. Uh, but she was able to to get an articling position. And I will say that she networked very, very heavily. Um, and I think that was probably the secret to her success. 
Yeah, and I, I definitely agree with you guys because I did not have any experience, any legal experience in Nigeria. You know, I was done with law school and I came to Canada and I was still able to get an article in position. So um, the answer to that is definitely yes. So the next question, we won't be able to take all the questions, but um, there's one here about, is there a preference for newly qualified lawyers over mature candidates? So I think the person is, um, Annalisa, do you want to go? Uh, sure. I would say that, no, there isn't a preference. Um, and I think I saw somebody else had a question about, um, you know, if you do have several years experience, should you highlight, mention that you're willing to start from scratch? I would say, yes, absolutely. Just because that will be the expectation as you come in from an article. Part of what we're evaluating is whether we think candidates are going to sort of play well as a team and that, you know, sometimes when you're articling, some of the jobs are not that glamorous at times where you've got to, you know, run a share certificate next door and that kind of thing. So we want somebody that even if you've been practicing for several years, you're going to have to do all of the kinds of articling work that students are expected to do despite your previous experience. So just um, we do want to get a sense that somebody is going to be a, a team player and is going to sort of learn from the ground up. Um, and, and it's not to say like we have lawyers sometimes who will make a comment where like, oh, this articling student is operating way above their level. And it's like, well, yeah, because they have previous experience, but uh, certainly not necessary. And also uh, just be aware that you'll need to uh, kind of start at the articling level and move up. I, I would only add one thing there. So I used to recruit English language teachers uh, and there were a lot of people who applied for jobs at the company I was recruiting for who had extensive English language teaching experience. And we didn't hire them because they weren't going to be willing to change their style of teaching to match what we were looking for. Uh, and so this is one of those things, again, where, you know, emphasizing the fact that you're you're willing to go back to step one, uh, realizing that your way of, of doing law in the past may be different than the Canadian way, may be different than the firm way, uh, and that you're really looking for an opportunity to learn. Thank you very much, Eric. Yeah, there was a, a lot of background noise around my area. I had to change my location. <laughs> yeah, so um, there's a question about what CV formats do you advise for internationally trained lawyers? Or Sorry, was it? What CV or resume formats do you advise for internationally trained lawyers? Uh, we're looking for one page uh, cover letter, two page maximum resume. Uh, reference letters, if they're absolutely glowing, ideally from an old employer, um, they're not necessary. And we would just say use them judiciously. If they're just sort of middling or sort of like they were nice or they worked, leave them out. Um, only include them if they really highlight sort of work experience or experience that you had at school that was really outstanding and no writing samples unless a firm asks for one, which I'm not aware of in Calgary that asks for them. So uh, don't include them unless you're, you're asked to. Yeah, I would say format wise, number one, as Annalise's uh, mentioned a couple of times, submit what the firm asks for. Part of the whole assessment of you as an applicant is can you follow instructions? Um, and so follow instructions. Um, the feedback that I've gotten from legal recruiters in Alberta and also from some outside Alberta is that um, you uh, lead with your education uh, and then follow that up with your work experience and then follow that up with volunteer work and then interests. Those, uh, I think if you include those four sections, you're doing well. Um, and I'd say the two page rule uh, does seem to be pretty standard across the board. Um, so again, that goes back to what I said is don't include everything you've ever done in your entire life. Leave out the things that aren't relevant. Uh, and then it may mean that you leave out some jobs. It may mean that you leave out some education um, because it's not going to really help you overly. Um, and yeah, um, be concise and you should do fine. 
Thank you very much, Annalisa and Eric. I think we'll just take about two or three more questions and then just wrap up this conversation. So I know an associate lawyer in a law firm and he or she had recommended me to apply. Can I put the lawyer's name in my cover letter for a reference? Um, would that be beneficial or detrimental in any way? And how do Canadian law firms view the aspect of referrals in a cover letter? Uh, I can answer the, uh, absolutely, if you've had contacts at a law firm, um, certainly mention them in your cover letter. Um, just make sure that the interaction that you had was significant enough that that person would remember it. Um, oftentimes, if I see that in a cover letter, I'll pick up the phone and call the associate or lawyer and say, hey, so-and-so has applied, they mentioned that they met with you, can you give me a little bit of background on that? So if it was just a passing, like you met me at a career fair and we said hello, don't include that because if I don't remember that, then I'm sh like, shoot, who was that person? So um, yes, absolutely. Those things, uh, the, those kind of connections can be very helpful. Um, and so what was the second part of the question? So um, I, the person is asking, how do Canadian law firms view the, as the aspect of referrals in a cover letter? I think it's still the same, still, still the same thing, asking how um, firms view, you know, referrals. I would say positively, and again, they're absolutely not necessary. Like most of the people that we hire have never, you know, like maybe they've had a phone call with an articling student or whatever, but we hire people all the time who don't have that connection. Um, so as I said, if it's a significant enough sort of conversation and it was positive on both sides of the equation, um, it'll only help you. Um, so no downside for including those. I, I would uh, I would echo what Annalise said, and the only thing I would add is that this is one of the advantages of having these one-on-one -on -one networking meetings, is that hopefully those meetings will be memorable enough that they can be used in this kind of situation. Thank you, guys. Um, so the next question is, if all of your work experience is not is not in, in the legal profession, how can you go about constructing your resume? Um, I would say that, you know, when we're looking to hire summer and articling students, we don't expect you to have any legal experience whatsoever. Um, we expect that you went to law school or are in law school, but otherwise the work experience that you have, um, it would be out of the ordinary to have legal experience, uh, you know, before finishing law school anyway. So um, it's the same sort of construct on our end that when list your, your work history, um, you know, highlight things that you did that were part of your you know, duties that you think are going to translate well into law. And it doesn't matter what that work history is. Like we, you know, hire people who have serving jobs, who have worked in offices, who worked on farms, one who was a minor recently, one who was a nurse. So it doesn't matter what that work experience is. It's how you uh, relate what it is you did, the skills that you learned, and how you're going to translate them into being a successful, you know, articling student and lawyer. Um, so don't get hung up on what the work experience is. It's more but like, what did you learn? You know, did you gain leadership? Did you get promoted over time? Why was that? I mean, if you worked somewhere for a really long time, that looks great as well. Did you work while you were in school? You know, it shows that you could balance, you know, competing demands on your time. So um, we certainly don't expect you to have legal experience, whether you're Canadian trained or foreign trained. And I have nothing to add on that. I would agree completely with what Annalisa just said. Okay, uh, we'll take one more question. So I'm a mother of two and when networking, I feel nervous about mentioning my kids because I feel firms won't want to hire me. Do you have any experience or tips about this? We'll start with Eric. Um, well, I don't have kids. <laughs> um, I don't have any direct experience, uh, but you know, um, I do have uh, experience of um, some students who are parents who, or particularly mothers who have found uh, work as articling students. Um, I think uh, one thing to do is to, to not make your children the focus of interviews and to not make them the focus of your, your, your job search. Um, yes, you want to support them. Uh, you know, have a game plan for um, for what you're going to do with your kids once you start working, so that if they're if it comes up that you're able to talk about that plan. Um, 
but also be aware that you know there there are there are questions that are are not supposed to be asked in interviews uh, in Canada, uh, and one of them is, do you have children? Um, if it comes up, if you volunteer that information, then you know that's fair game. Uh, but if you if you don't want people to know about it, then just don't talk about it, and you should expect that you won't be asked about it. Uh, I certainly agree with everything that Eric uh, said. Um, we find that students, it's a very personal decision whether or not to let us know if you have kids or not. Like you said, we can never ask you that. Um, and if you choose not to tell us that, like, and you get hired, it's that's no issue. Um, the only thing to Eric's point is make sure that, yeah, you have a plan for uh, how you're going to manage your, you know, home life. And that goes for, for anyone, really, home life and articling. Um, the realities of articling, especially at a larger firm, are that it's not just a nine to five job. It tends to involve some later evenings sometimes, some weekends sometimes. So, um, you know, firms will be accommodating, um, but just, you know, sort of be aware that that will be the expectation once you land an article, especially if you are a larger firm. Um, but certainly don't, don't feel the need that you have to disclose that you have children at all. Thank you very much, guys. And I know I said that was the last question, but I will just, Ask one more. <laughs> what should the structure of a cover letter look like? And th this is the last one, I promise. Uh, I would say sort of intro paragraph where you say sort of who you are, what your background is. You know, I'm a recent graduate. I'm a 3L student, whatever it is. I'm applying to your firm. I'm interested in your firm because of X, Y, and Z. Uh, then go into sort of the body of it where you talk about your relevant experience that you think that, that you want to highlight. So whether it's, you know, academic accomplishments, work accomplishments, combination of both of those things, um, highlight it, uh, you know, be as concise as you possibly can, uh, and then sort of wrap up with, you know, here's where you can contact me to schedule an interview, that kind of thing. So, and don't have it just be a regurgitation of everything you put in your resume. Um, this is the time to pick some of the things from your resume, whether it's work or, school or extracurricular, whatever it was that sort of sets you apart or that you really think makes you an outstanding candidate, that's where you, you highlight it. I would agree uh, with everything there. Uh, and if anybody's interested uh, on my LinkedIn profile, the second thing is that coffee meeting uh, webinar. The third thing is an article on how to write a cover letter, uh, which conforms very closely to what Annalisa just said. Uh, that article is focused on an accounting position, but everything translates to applying for a, a, a legal position as well. So have a look at that and, and see if that helps. Thank you very much, guys. Um, I will encourage everyone to check out um, the resources that Eric has mentioned. And I really, really learned a lot from everything you guys have shared today. And I'm sure um, everyone, you know, who is attending this has also learned a lot from you guys. You guys shared a lot of solid tips. And I'm sure people who have listened will, you know, put them into practice and that will make a difference. I would like to um, hand this over back to Kenny so that um, he can wrap this up. Thank you. Wow. Thank you so much for taking the time, guys. Uh, very insightful tips that you've all shared today. I'm no longer looking for an article in position, but I wish I knew these things when I was searching. <laughs> and I can definitely confirm that um, some of the things Annalisa said because I had previously interviewed at Bennett Jones before. The interview, they don't ask you anything about substantive law. We're just basically chatting about life. And I didn't know when 25 minutes passed by. So definitely that's, that's uh, correct. And I also say, make sure you reach out to current articling students at the firm. I learned a great deal about this. In fact, uh, the other national firm that I had interviewed at, which I got a role, I learned a lot from the articling students because I was supposed to attend a game night. And some of them told me, don't go to this game night, go to that game night. Because if you go to this game night, your chances of winning is very slim. So definitely speak to articling students because you don't want to go to a game night where they are playing trivia and you're not a Canadian, you're gonna lose. So that's all I'm gonna say. Uh, really, thanks for taking the time, Annalisa. Thanks for taking the time, Eric. Moyo, you've done a fantastic job today. Thanks for agreeing to moderate this chat for us. On behalf of the entire ITL Network team, I would like to say thank you all for joining us today. The recording of this um, session can be will be available on our YouTube page shortly. So if you want to revisit any of the tips that have been shared by our speakers today, you can definitely check us out on YouTube. 
Uh, the name is the ITL Network. Uh, thanks, everyone, once again, and have a wonderful weekend. Bye. Thank you all. Thank you. Bye for now. Bye.